What's going on, guys? And welcome back to Hashtag Ask GSM here today for Wednesday, July 12th, 2023, episode 502. I'm Graham GSM Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well and having a great week so far. If you want to send a question to the show, you can do so by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag Ask GSM. Find me on the Facebook as well, facebook.com backslash Graham the GSM Matthews. Drop a comment on the post that I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not in the wall itself. And last but certainly not least, drop your question down below in the comment section on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. We'll get right into it here, starting with Micah Does It from YouTube. Their first question was, uh, Shayna Baszler versus Ronda Rousey. Fight pit match. Loser leaves WWE at SummerSlam. Yes or no? I like that. I mean, obviously it makes it a bit too obvious for those that know Ronda's on her way out. I don't know if that's the vast majority, though. I mean, that was the online report. It was believed that she's probably on her way out. Shane is not going anywhere. Shane is not losing that match, especially if they add that stipulation. If they don't have that loser leaves WWE stipulation, there's more of a chance that Ronda could win. Ronda should not win. It doesn't really matter to me. Shayna should win. She likely will win. Um, yeah, that would explain why Ronda is not going to be there anymore after SummerSlam, assuming that is her end date, because it was reported by Meltzer, I think, last week that she's, although she's on her way out, um, he didn't specify an end date for Ronda. I assume they rushed into the feud because they want to do it at SummerSlam and they want to end the feud there because she's on her way out, like imminently. And she's not going to be sticking around until the fall or Mania, Rumble, whatever. She wants to do the feud now. And they didn't have a chance to do it previously because they put the tag titles on them and they had to rush the whole thing, which is just a mess, but whatever. But anyway, they do the match at SummerSlam, and I'm not convinced they're doing it at the pay-per-view. I hope they do. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I just think there's a chance they might do it on Raw or whatever because they only have so many spots for SummerSlam matches, and I'd rather they not, you know, overfill that show with matches. I do think Shayna and Ronda should be on there. The lo <clears throat> Excuse me, the loser leaves WWE stipulation makes sense. Making it a fight pitch match makes the most sense to me as well. Uh, we haven't had one since the Rollins-Riddle one on the main roster back at Extreme Rules in October of last year. I think it would work well for those two. It might make the match more interesting than it would have been, you know, than it would be without a stipulation. They could probably still have a good match, but Ronda's matches have been very hit or miss. And that's not even to say the fight pit match would be great. I just feel like it would fit their strengths more as, you know, former MMA fighters and having that sort of background and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I think a fight pit match, a loser leaves WWE at SummerSlam. I think that'd be cool. Sign me up. Next question, also from Micah. Um, what match would you want to see? Four horsewomen, Fatal 4-Way, Becky Lynch versus Charlotte Flair versus Sasha Banks versus Bayley at Mania for the women's title. A Shield triple threat match at Mania with the current version of the Shield, uh, Tribal Chief Roman Reigns versus John Moxley versus Seth Rollins for the title. Or a New Day triple threat match, Kofi Kingston versus Big E versus Xavier Woods at Mania for the title. I mean, I feel like not the only answer, but the best possible answer there has got to be Roman, John, Moxley, and Seth Rollins. It has to be. Uh, the New Day triple threat, I mean, as cool as it, as it would be, considering they've all been partners now for almost a decade, that's not like a WWE championship match. It's just not. Um, I, I love all three guys. I love the group. Woods, to me, is not a world champion performer. I mean, he at least has not been portrayed that way in his entire time on the main roster. Kofi was a world champion for a cup of coffee. I mean, he was champion for six months, but he was never a world champion prior to that point, and he hasn't been a world champion since. So again, I don't really buy Kofi being in a world title match again at Mania, even if it was a New Day triple threat match. And Big E's great, but I feel like he has the most singles potential out of all three. Um, I just, that's not a world championship match um, at Mania that I would really care to see. It would be cool, but compared to the other two, it doesn't even come close. Becky, Charlotte, Sasha, and Bailey would be awesome. Um, you didn't say like the current versions of all four women. You said that with the shield. You didn't say that with those women. So I assume it would be like current heel, Bailey, Mercedes, Monet, Charlotte, whatever the fuck she's doing and Becky Lynch. Um, I feel like the best version of that match would have been what we got almost 10 years ago in NXT. Nowadays, if they were to do the match, it would be great. I just feel like the time to do that match would have been in 2019 on the main roster in either 2019 or 2020. When they were all interacting anyway, we were getting four horsewomen tag team matches. And it kind of seemed like that could have been the match for Mania uh, at 30. I mean, that COVID happened. But even if COVID didn't happen, they were still going to do Bailey and Sasha in the SmackDown Women's Championship match. Charlotte and Rhea for the NXT Women's title. And Becky versus Shayna for the Raw Women's title. 
So they weren't going to do it anyway. I think they thought they would always have that opportunity to do it at some point down the road, and they just ran out of time. At least with the Shield, they probably figured Dean Ambrose wouldn't go anywhere, a lot like Roman and Seth. Thankfully, they did that match. I mean, we got the four hor- four horsewomen fatal four way match, but two things: one, it was before they were officially the four horsewomen of WWE NXT, whatever, and two. It was during their NXT days when they weren't as big of stars as they would end up becoming a few years later. Um, they were all great. That was an excellent match at TakeOver. Not Fatal 4-Way. Was it Rival, I think? Was it the Rival show? It was February of 2015. I know that. Um, it would have been an even better match a couple of years later when all four women were at their peaks in terms of how they were in the ring. And they're all still excellent, obviously. Um, but they were at their peak of stardom, I would say. Or at least... Becky specifically, Bailey definitely. Bailey's great currently as a heel. I'm thinking like babyface Bailey. Babyface Becky, heel Sasha, heel Charlotte. That at Mania would have fucking been awesome. But they never got around to it. We came they came close. They did Charlotte, Bailey, and Sasha and Naya at Mania 33 for the Raw Women's Championship. But it wasn't the same and Becky was over on SmackDown at that point. But anyway, so we already got the four horsewomen match technically in NXT. The Shield triple threat we did get, thankfully. And we got it at the right time, too. It wasn't a random match on Raw. I mean, they also did it in FCW back in the day, oddly enough. Um, But they did do it at that Battleground show in 2016. A great show. It was the end of an era for WWE right before the brand split went into effect and the draft was brought back and uh, Rollins and Roman remained on Raw. John Moxley, Dean Ambrose went to SmackDown. He won. And Rollins and Roman were the ones that prior to that point had been multi-time world champions They were the bigger stars. Um, Dean Ambrose was not the biggest star of the bunch, but he was the most popular with the fans. And they were able to put him over clean, and it was a great match. And he actually pinned Roman, I think, as well. Um, Just a great match, though. I really enjoyed that. But I think an even bigger match than that would be if they were to do it today, with Roman being at his peak. We talk about, like, the peak of, like, the women and where they were in terms of their fandom and whatever. I mean, you can argue, I mean, there is definitely an argument that John Moxley was a bigger star as Dean Ambrose in WWE just due to the platform, but Moxley has become more of a world champion material performer in AEW, three-time world champion, really has carried the company uh, for the last number of years. I feel like he is more in his prime now. I mean, I hate the fucking hardcore stuff all the time and the constant bleeding, but he really was a uh, workhorse and has been a workhorse for that company since he went there four years ago. So, current John Moxley, to me, would supersede the Dean Ambrose of 2016. The Rollins of now is an even bigger star than he was in 2016. And Roman Reigns isn't even close in terms of the, as big of a star as he is now compared to what he was in, even in 2016. So, that would be the ultimate match to me. The Four Horsewomen match sounds great. Um, you know, I just don't... I, if they were to do it now, it would be awesome. I just feel like the Shield match is more appealing, and the New Day match would be great as well, but that's just not, you You said specifically it for all three matches, for the title at WrestleMania, that to me, unless it's for like the fucking Intercontinental Championship, does not feel like a world title triple threat match, unless they booked all three guys differently than how they have, than how they have been booked for the last number of years recently, um, let's see, his next question, he says, okay, here's a tough question, who was the best live crowd, list these in order from best to worst, Clash of the Castle 2022, Elimination Chamber 2023, Backlash 2023, and Money in the Bank 2023. Man, that is a tough question. I was at the Elimination Chamber show in Montreal with RJ. We had a great time. I I haven't watched that show back on Peacock, so I don't know how loud the crowd came across on the show. I know they were electric for the main event, specifically Sami Zayn. The rest of that show was awesome, and I know they were a hot crowd. I just don't know how they were. I don't think they... I think that would have been a great show regardless of where it was. The Sammy matches were where they really where we really made a difference in terms of uh, in terms of the crowd and whatnot. I'm honestly probably going to put that last, uh, probably. So I'm going to put Elimination Chamber last again. I was I can't even say I'm biased because I'm putting it last, but it was a great show with a great crowd. I just don't remember that being like what really enhanced the show. For example, I'm going to go so that worst. The best to me is Backlash. I feel like that was a very good show, but it was made even better by that crowd, specifically for a number of matches for Bianca and Io, for Bad Bunny and Damian Priest, among other matches on that show. I gotta go Puerto Rico. They were just wild and electric, one of the best crowds in recent WWE history, if not ever. 
Um, that's got to be number one to me. So then Money in the Bank and Clash of the Castle are kind of interchangeable. The London crowd slash Cardiff crowds were great for both shows. Both shows were excellent. I'll probably go Clash first just because of the... I mean, the atmosphere for Money in the Bank's main event, the, the Bloodline Civil War was great. Clash, it was a different atmosphere for the two biggest matches of the night because they were really behind Drew against Roman. And then they were also really into Walter, Gunther, whatever, and Sheamus for the Intercontinental Championship because of both guys being from Europe. So I got to go that match or that show too, in order here from best to worst. Backlash 2023 is number one. Clash of the Castle 2022 is number two. Uh, Money in the Bank 2023 is at number three. And Elimination Chamber 2023 is at four. Although all four were great crowds and great shows. At Reborn Again, John Ritland from the Twitter machine. Also check him out on YouTube. Real Honesty with John Ritland does great work. His first question was, do you think Collision will steadily improve their ratings or will they just stay stuck between five and 600,000 viewers? No, I think they'll just stay stuck at that time or that, uh, that viewership range. I actually love Collision. I've said this before, but I think it's the best weekly wrestling show that I watch. More so than Raw, SmackDown, Dynamite, at least the one that I enjoy the most personally. Um, it's just been a very good show, consistently solid for the last four weeks. The problem is that it's on a fucking Saturday night. That just, it just doesn't help. And it's not going to help when it has to go up against WWE pay-per-views and other events going on on Saturdays. It's this summer. Um, if the shows are as good as they are now, and who knows if, if they'll be consistently quality shows a month or two from now. We don't know. We're still in the infancy of the program. It might deteriorate like Rampage did after a while and just become another show. That'll be even worse. I mean, the show realistically should be doing higher numbers, much higher numbers than fucking Rampage. Rampage also airs. I mean, I feel like more people are more willing to watch wrestling on a Friday night just because it's been tradition for so long with SmackDown and other shows. Compared to wrestling, I know wrestling used to air on Saturday nights back in the day. That was fucking 30 years ago. I mean, it's just not the same. It's a different audience. It's a different time period. It's a tough night to watch Collision. I actually, I don't think I've, I watched the show on a happenstance because I just so happened to be around a couple of weeks ago. Of the four shows, I've watched only one of them barely live. The other three, I did not. It's just a tough night for wrestling. So um, I think it'll stay around that range. Dynamite even has been stuck at the same I mean, they haven't really gone down drastically, but they haven't improved drastically consistently either. I feel like that's the issue that AEW has with their shows, as great as, as some of these shows. I mean, WWE has the same issue. I mean, it's not like they're drastically improving, although SmackDown's numbers are significantly stronger than they were due to the Bloodline stuff. I mean, that's just a fact. Um, it's one thing for WWE to stay stagnant. I mean, it's the biggest company in the world for wrestling. Um, AEW should be growing if they want to be a legitimate competition to... WWE, and they're just not really growing as much as they probably should. They are in terms of attendance, I mean, look at All In, but in, in terms of viewership, that's still an issue, specifically with Rampage and now Collision. Um, it doesn't paint a great story, doesn't paint a very pretty picture, but I am enjoying the show. I mean, I don't really have any... I, I should probably watch live more, but again, that's I'm, I'm one of those people that would like to watch wrestling live more, and if I don't have a chance to do it, I imagine most people don't have a chance to do it either. Um, and I'm a wrestling freak. And if you're not a wrestling freak, you're probably not going out of your way to watch wrestling on a Saturday night. His next question, with All In and All Out taking place within a week of each other, do you think AEW will do a package deal if both are put on pay-per-view? Because asking fans to pay $50 for each show with that short of a window is ridiculous. Um, I, I don't know if they will or won't. I mean, I know you're not asking me if, if I think they will. You're asking me if I think they will, not if I know I will. they will, obviously. Um... I, always, I just always lean on, like, more worst-case scenario type mindset. So I'm going probably not. They probably will just do both at the regular price point because they're going to be two regular shows. It's not like All In's a two-hour, you know, like, special or that All Out's going to be a two-hour special. No, they're two big pay-per-views. Do I think they should be running them within a week of, the, of each other? No, I don't, actually. I really do think they should either space them out better or just not do All Out at all. It's really not that big of a deal. I think they should have taken a, a year off from All Out, but Tony Khan wants to go All Out, pun intended, and make this a big show for both shows. I do think they will put both on pay-per-view, on, on Bleach Report, whatever, and they'll both be $50. I mean, should one of them be on HBO Max and try out that live streaming service with wrestling? Absolutely, and people have said that. There's been no zero indication that's going to be the case. The pay-per-view comes up in about six weeks, so they have time to announce it, obviously. 
But if there hasn't even been rumblings of that. Like I haven't even seen any reports indicating that could be the case. Right now, the the impression is that both pay-per-views will be full price on Bleach Report, pay-per-view, whatever, and you're paying fucking $50 for them. Even if they're great shows. Like, I could see the argument, oh, if they're big super shows, then you're paying for two big super shows. It's the timing of it. Paying $50 one week and then $50 the next week for the same fucking company, when it's probably going to be a lot of the same people on both shows, I think both shows will be great. The AEW pay-per-views are typically very enjoyable. I just don't see... I just don't see how that's a wise decision, though. I mean, I don't really see them building up all out while sim simultaneously building up all in. I feel like they're going to build up all in. All their eggs are going to be in that basket. And then as soon as that's over, they're going to put together a card for all out on the subsequent Wednesdays. Dynamite and Collision, they're going to rush to put together a card. They fucking rush to put together a card for pay-per-views that they have three months to build towards, let alone a week. So, I, I don't know. I don't think they will. I mean, I'm just thinking, again, worst case scenario like realism mindset here will they do some sort of a deal where if you buy one you get 50 percent off the other one or like it's 75 dollars total i'm not saying they won't because tony khan i'm not gonna say he's a man of the people but you know he, he i'm sure he sees these complaints or concerns or whatever um i just don't think they will i'm not sure if the um you know the services whether it be the streaming services that these pay-per-views air on or the pay-per-view themselves I'm, I'm not exactly sure I don't know if they would want people getting a deal on that when they will be three or two big shows of equal value in terms of how they're presented. In terms of the card, I, I assume All In will be the bigger show because that's at Wembley with 90,000. I mean, they've been to Chicago for All Out a million times. Who gives a shit? Um, that'll probably just be like, oh, and this show happened too. But on paper, though, there are two still regular pay-per-views and they probably want you to pay double for them. I don't like that mindset either, but that's probably what they're going to do. I, I would really hope... I, I would love to be wrong. I would love to be wrong on that one. Uh, Non-wrestling related, how do you think Indiana Jones 5 stacks up to the rest of the franchise? Side note, I made my feelings on it quite clear if you recall. Yes, John did not like the movie. Most people did not like the movie. I think it was a mixed bag review for a lot of people. I did like it. I actually did enjoy the movie. I mean, I would not come to me for movie advice because I tend to enjoy most of what I say. Um, I'm not a movie connoisseur by any means. I mean, I am. I love watching movies. I'm just not... I'm not saying I have bad taste, but I'm also not going to be watching as many movies as John is and have as good of an expert opinion as John does. John is the person to go to for good quality opinions on movies. So he's probably right. I didn't love the movie. I did thoroughly enjoy it. It was slower paced at points, a little long, specifically that opening scene that was dragged out for a little longer than it needed to. I didn't mind the CGI. That looked good. Um, where would it rank among the rest of the franchise? I, you know, I didn't love 2. I thought 2 was good. It was a good fine Indiana Jones movie. One is just a classic. Three is excellent. And then four is was is what it is. I, I've rewatched all of them recently. I rewatched the first four ahead of the fifth one. And I enjoyed them all. I would say I enjoyed five more than two and four. If you put it last, I mean, that's fine too. But I would say my ranking would be three, then one, then five, then two, then four. That's probably what I would do. Um, next question from at Iwagu91. Their first question was, when Danielson and Okada run it back, and while I understand they are not a frequent watcher of the promotion, do you suppose it'll be in a New Japan ring, especially Wrestle Kingdom next year? I think I answered this a couple of weeks ago from someone else, but the answer is yes, I do. Um, I do think they'll hold off on the rematch until Wrestle Kingdom, have Okada get the win back there. They love people getting their win back and whatever, and I do think they can have an even better match than what we got at Forbidden Door. For as great as that match was, I feel like they could do even better. And hopefully next time Danielson doesn't get hurt or isn't going hurt going into it or whatever. Um, yeah, I do think that'll be the match for Wrestle Kingdom in January. And I tend to watch now... I mean, I actually have watched the last full couple of Wrestle Kingdoms. I think I watched Wrestle Kingdom in its entirety. N not the Noah stuff, like the, the Noah versus New Japan. I didn't watch that. I think I have watched Wrestle Kingdom in full in 2021, 2022, and 2023. And I think I've only watched the key matches in 2020. I don't think I watched... I don't think I watched... I, d I don't think I watched all of it in 2019 or 2020. I watched the key matches, I believe, in 2018. Maybe 2017, I watched Okada Omega. I remember that. And uh, 2016, I did as well. 2015, I think I watched the whole show. 
So I, I, I tend to keep up with Wrestle Kingdom. The other shows, not so much. Um, but regardless, I will be watching Danielson and Okada come Wrestle Kingdom next year because that rematch would be even better than the original. And also a di different atmosphere in uh, Japan as well. His next question, did you know that Danielson was supposed to face Ishii on the Dynamite after Forbidden Door? I did not know that. Um, I assume Tony Khan said that somewhere. I don't know where you saw that. I did not see that myself. Um, that would make sense because Moxley and Ishii, as good of a match as that was, they've faced off before, and maybe that was part of the appeal, that they've had a match and they're going to have a rematch. It does make sense. Tony Khan is big on giving fresh matches. And while Danielson's faced Okada and Suzuki, he hasn't had a match yet with Ishii, at least not on a major promotion like AEW. So that would have made sense. Danielson obviously would have won, but it would have been a good match. Um, no, that would have been cool. Hopefully at some point we can get that. I do enjoy Ishii. That was your next question. Speaking of Tomohiro Ishii, what are your thoughts on him? He asks, um, I like Ishii. He's not my favorite New Japan guy, but he's a hard hitter. Put him in the ring with someone that can match that style, whether it be an AEW Impact or elsewhere. I've seen him in a number of different... Um, not uh, sceneries, I guess, environments, whatever. I've seen his some of his work in New Japan. I've seen a number of his matches, all of his matches in AW, and I also saw him work a number of matches in Impact as well. Um, he and Josh Alexander had a great match about a year ago for the Impact World Title. Um, so yeah, I enjoy Ishii. He's not again my favorite guy in New Japan, but I've seen enough of him to enjoy his work. At it's Bergen from Twitter. Um, their first question was: Since 2010, what have been your favorite and least favorite years of wrestling in general in terms of the product? So I answered this, I think this was the last question I answered on 500 two weeks ago, so we won't go too great in depth with it, because for anyone that's already heard it, I don't want to repeat myself too much, but you said my favorite and least favorite years since 2010. Um, I would include 08 among my favorite, because that was when I first started watching, but you're saying since 2010. 2010 overall was not a great year for wrestling. Um, like I enjoyed the road to WrestleMania and whatnot, I was a freshman in high school at that point, and there were things about 2010 I enjoyed, like the Nexus, but that was botched. The final few months of the year were not great. Um, 2011 was among my favorite. 2011 was, again, certain parts of the product throughout the year were not great, but Punk and Cena and Orton and Christian were enough to make up for it. And the road to WrestleMania was fun, aside from Mania itself being a just fucking terrible show. Um, overall, 2011 I enjoyed. 2012 I enjoyed... 2013, parts of it I enjoyed overall, I did not. That was probably among my least favorite years was 2013. 2014 had its moments. 2015 I enjoyed. 2016 I enjoyed. Uh, 2018 overall I did not like. 2020, just because of COVID, I did not like. Uh, 2017 was alright. 2019, I already mentioned. Did I mention 2019? 2019 I just did. Again, the, the, the product was not great. Going into Mania, coming out of Mania, there just wasn't a lot to get excited about. The fucking wild card rule bullshit. I did not like 2019. Uh, 2021 was half COVID. In 2022, I've uh, I enjoyed it as as I have 2023. So um, off the top of my head, I probably gave a different answer a couple of weeks ago. But among my favorites were 2011. I don't know about 2014. Probably I I really did like 2015 parts of it. Um, 2016 I also really like for the brand split being brought back. 2016 and 2011 are among my favorite years in wrestling, specifically 2016 SmackDown. That gets says a lot, but that really was a great period for the blue brand. And then just in recent years, since 2016, my favorite, probably last year I would guess, because again, half of 2021 was COVID. 2020 was almost all COVID. And I can't include any year that includes COVID among my favorites. I mean, 2021 for AEW was amazing, but if you're talking about WWE, it would not be 2021. Last year I liked. I liked 2022, um, specifically for when Triple H took over in the second half of the year. So I would probably go 2022 among my favorite years in wrestling. 2023 so far has been fine. Um, and, uh, you know, 2011 and 2016. Among my least favorites, like I said, 2010 sucked. 2013 overall sucked. 2018 was not good. 2020 as well, just due to COVID. And it wasn't like the worst year I've ever watched wrestling, but without crowds, it's just there's not a lot of enjoyment there. Um, at noob underscore n underscore co tv, their first question was Who's going to be the final members of the Elite in Blackpool Combat Club for Blood and Guts? Uh, for the Elite, it's Kota Ibushi in Blackpool Combat Club, either CM Punk or Shota Umino. Uh, those are my choices for Blood and Guts. 
I think Kota Ibushi's a lock for the Elite. We'll find out tonight. They're going to give away, they're going to reveal who the final members of each team are. Um, I think Kota Ibushi makes the most sense. That's going to be awesome. I will be there for Blood and Guts next week, so I'm looking forward to it. But yeah, if Ibushi's on the Elite, for Blackpool Combat Club, other people have said this. I said I, the, the most likely candidate is Chris Jericho just because of what he teased with Don Callis, maybe doing him a favor. He'll step up to help out Blackpool Combat Club. Um, not because he likes them, but just to help out Don Callis. I could see that. Uh, Shota Umino, I, I guess that would just be super fucking underwhelming. I know he just teamed with Blackpool Combat Club at Forbidden Door. There's a pretty good chance that he could be. I mean, I, I don't know. New Japan's in the middle of the G1 Climax. I don't know if he's in that or if it has anything to do with that. I don't know. I don't know if he... Like, that's why Eddie Kingston's not in Blood and Guts, because he's in Japan for, for the G1 Climax. Um... So yeah, just with, uh, Shota would be fine. It would make sense because he has history with Moxley. I just don't really care to see it. Punk is not happening. I saw the report. Punk wants to be a part of it. <laughs> Punk is not going to be in that fucking match. If there's a fucking lawsuit where they can't even be in the same vicinity as each other, why the fuck would they be in the same match with each other within weeks of Punk coming back to the company? That just makes no sense. I would love to see it. Don't get me wrong. That's incredibly unrealistic. I will eat my fucking hat tonight if they reveal Punk as the final member of either team, but I'm almost positive that's not happening. I'm going to go Jericho. I think Jericho is probably the most likely choice. And even if it doesn't make as much sense as Shota Umino, I would rather Jericho be in the match. Whereas, I mean, I'm not a big fan of Jericho's current work, but I'd rather Jericho be in there over Umino. He's just not a big name, and I just don't give a fuck about Umino being in the match. Jericho is a bigger name with more of a reason to be in there as as far as like wanting to do Callus a favor by helping out Team Blackpool Combat Club, specifically Takeshka. Um, next question to theirs. It's been one year since Triple H became head of WWE Creative. What are your thoughts on him as head of Creative, and what have been his best booking decisions and bad booking decisions? I, get him, I give him a 7 out of 10. It's not good or bad, it's all right. Well, listen, if you're saying it's not good or bad, it's been all right, then it would probably be fucking 5 out of 10. 7 out of 10 is pretty favorable. It's not great, but it's good. Seven would be good. Uh, five would be all right. But nitpicking aside, I've enjoyed the Triple H era. Uh, I can't say tenfold more than the Vince era because they have gone back to some stuff like the constant fucking rematches and stuff like that. But listen, the repackaging of several people, the pay-per-views have been on fire, the Bloodline stuff has been excellent. Uh, they've really booked Gunther well, some of the recent NXT call-ups well, like Solo Sokoa and Zoe Stark and people like that. Um, they've done right by all those people. And I've enjoyed the Triple H era overall. I mean, we can go into a more in-depth analysis at another point. Um, but I do think the, the fact that we're coming up on a year of the Triple H era in WWE is crazy. Just considering um, that we never thought it would be a possibility. Now, Vince is back. That's part of the problem. And we don't know if certain ideas come from him, if they come from Triple H or whatever. But still, not that every Triple H decision has been has been amazing. I mean, specifically, the women's division has been his weakest point, his Achilles heel during this period. Uh, the women's division has not been great overall at all. I mean, there really hasn't been a lot of thought put into the women's division. Uh, damage control was a bust. Bianca and Rhea have really been the focal points, which has been great. I appreciate that they've been building them up and making them an important part of the show. But just a lot of the other storylines have been lacking. The Becky and Trish stuff has been fine. Uh, they got Ronda and Shayna going on now, which is good. The SmackDown Women's Division has needed help. They lost Sasha Banks. You could not bring back Sasha. You couldn't bring back Naomi. You couldn't land G. White. That was also a big blunder to me. They haven't brought in any free agents this year. Now, they have a very big roster. They brought back a lot of people to give them second chances. But that also falls on the other side of the coin as well. People like Karrion Cross, Tegan Knox, they just haven't gotten over. No one gives a shit. Like... At that point, why even bother bringing them back if they're not going to really be any better off than they were previously? Bronson Reed's done well, but Johnny Gargano's been a massive disappointment. Candice LeRae has done nothing. Um, they called up the way. I mean, they called up Indy. She's done absolutely nothing so far. They've brought back a lot of people. Um, I don't know, like, really, as far as the people... Like, even Bray Wyatt, they brought back Bray, and he had an amazing return. But his run was also a bust. I mean, he ended up doing the same old typical Bray Wyatt supernatural cryptic shit that he was doing previously, and it fucking was terrible towards the end there with Bobby Lashley. It was great early on. Braun did well, but he's hurt right now. So a lot of the Triple H rehires have not worked out. Hit Row has been a fucking bust. They've been terrible. Um, who else have they brought back? Mi Chin. Mia Yim has done fine. You know, again, they, I think Triple H is bigger 
win here was not bringing people back. A lot of those people, pretty much all those people, I didn't mind being brought back. And it's not scraping the bottom of the barrel. Like, they brought back Dexter Loomis again, and they brought back him, and he's done absolutely nothing. They pushed him for a couple of months, and he hasn't been on, on TV in, in, in fucking months. So, I mean, a lot of the rehires have been a bust, and, and it's pretty obvious that a lot of those people were just brought back to fill out the roster, but if they're not doing anything, then, again, what's even the point? What, what's even the point at that point? I just don't get it. But anyway, um, I think, again, Triple H's bigger positive has been repackaging people, giving them another chance. Like, LA Knight was, has been a success story, but they should be doing more of them, more with him, obviously. But if Vince was still in charge, Max Dupree would have been fired by now. He, he would have been gone. He repackaged him. He repackaged Piper Niven. Uh, Gunther, who the fuck knows what happened. I mean, he was used well by Vince early on. Would he have lost the championship by now? Almost absolutely. Would he have been repackaged by now? Probably. Um, you know, I, I I don't know what else they would have done with Gunther beyond what we saw with Vince before he left last year. But it probably would not have been good. But they gave a lot of people their their first names back. Matt Riddle got his name back. Tommaso Ciampa got his name back, among other people. That stuff has been great. Um, just better matches and some better stories. The product isn't tremendously better than it was, but it is better. To me, I've enjoyed the Triple H shows more than I did the Vince shows, which were just were fucking god-awful. Some of the Triple H shows are very uneventful, but the Vince shows towards the end there were fucking god-awful. And we do not need to go back. I mean, Vince is still in charge or still a part of creative now, but seemingly he does not have as much influence as he did before he left a year ago. Um, those shows were just the dirt fucking worst. Like, Dancing Shanky, never bring me back to that time period, please. That was just, the, again, the fucking worst. Um, anyway, but I think overall it's been a success. There's still a lot more work to be done, a lot of areas he can improve upon. Again, going back to less rematches, more fresh matches, not dragging shit out for no fucking reason. Like, the Miz and Loomis feud was like five months. Why? It had a lackluster ending, and we haven't even seen Loomis since. Miz didn't benefit from it at all. So again, who did it benefit? What purpose did it serve? It wasn't even entertaining towards the end there. No one cared towards the end. They need to do a better job of that stuff. But again, overall, they have a better sense of where stuff is going, mapping it out long term. With again, like the Becky and Trish stuff feels like a long term project. The Bloodline stuff was a long term storyline. Uh, bringing back the World Heavyweight Championship was great. We have two world titles again, thank God. Um, doing a draft, which hasn't helped all that much, but they do have, they have kept the rosters a little bit better than they were previously. They brought back the brand split to an extent. Um, they renamed the women's championships, the women's world title, the WWE women's championship. I mean, again, those are both very positive developments. They got rid of the 24 seven title. Thank fucking God. So I think the positives outweigh the negatives. There's still a lot more, a lot more work to be done. Um, I don't know what I would give it out of 10, probably a 7 as well, I would say. I mean, you're saying it's all right. I would say that's good. That's just subjective on my part, I guess. Um, but there's still more they can improve upon, and I don't think certain things will ever go away until Vince is completely gone from creative as he was a year ago, until he resurfaced six months later. Their next question, do you find modern wrestling fans, especially modern WWE and AEW fans, disrespectful? I'm going to be honest, wrestling fans just need to enjoy watching wrestling and not be on social media because that'll paint a bad picture of, of the wrestlers and wrestling in general. I mean, a lot of wrestling fans do embarrass themselves on Twitter with a lot of the shit they say and how they conduct themselves. That's no different than any other fandom. It makes wrestling fans look bad, but I've seen plenty of other fandoms where people threaten actors and sports athletes and entertainment talent and, and stuff like that on Twitter constantly. That's just... That's the negativity that social media breeds. It's not a wrestling problem. That's a social media problem. I try to find the positives out of using social media, which is why I use it, obviously, in addition to just professional purposes. Um, I do think there's pros to social media. I mean, I would not I would not be able to collect questions for the show and, and connect with you guys if it wasn't for Twitter and stuff like that. Um, are, are fans disrespectful? I mean, again, I'm not going to paint a broad brush here and say that, that every wrestling fan is disrespectful. There are a number of people that are just fucking dumb mouth breathers that, that, that don't know how to conduct themselves in real life situations that go about making an ass out of themselves in social media for sure with how they talk to people, adding people. I mean, again, it's one thing to have an opinion, but when you go out of your way to either shit on someone's opinion for no reason or just shit on like a certain individual, whether it be a wrestler or whatever, a talent, and thinking they're not going to see it when they usually do, whether they respond or not, it just is... is basically borderline harassment. I just don't understand that. I've never understood that. 
Um, again, wrestling fans have always been disrespectful, though. That's not really a new thing. Um, you know, people just need to watch wrestling and enjoy it. I mean, I agree. I mean, then again, people aren't going to not complain. It depends what we're complaining about, within reason. If people are going to shit on everything, then yes. I mean, then just don't follow these people. Don't watch their shit. Don't watch their content. But people are entitled to an opinion. If they don't like it, they don't have to fucking like it. They're not just going to sit there and enjoy everything that they watch and then praise everything that they watch. I mean, for example, I can't just come on here and other places and in articles and just write about the positive of WWE and AEW. No, we got to keep it fair here and shit on the stuff that's bad and praise the stuff that's good. That's just how it goes. Um, but fans being disrespectful, I mean, that's always been the case. That's not really a new phenomenon by any means. At the average grunt, his question was, who is on your short list of wrestlers that you want to see win the AEW International Championship in the future? For me, it's Claudio. Uh, Claudio Castagnoli is my top pick. But I would also like to see Sean Spears, Jay White, and perhaps Brian Danielson have a run with it at some point. Uh, Sean Spears, I could not give absolutely two fucks about at this point. The fact he's getting a TNT title shot, Canada or not, the fact they're in Canada, who cares? Against Lucha fucking Soros in 2023 is mind-boggling to me. We'll talk about Brian Pillman Jr. in a second, among other people that they have on their roster, and the fact they don't do shit with these people. But they have time at the Battle of the Belt show to do Sean Spears and Lucha Soros? What, what the fuck is this? Who cares? I, I don't understand that one at all. Um, anyway, not the shit on your favorite there, but, you know... Jay White is someone that I think we can both agree on. Brian Danielson is would be a good pick, but I just feel like he's a... I can't even really say that he's above it, just because, um, you know, the championship is probably the most prestigious in the entire company beyond the world championship. Um, you know, surprisingly enough, it, they, they've built it up fairly well and have booked it to be a prestigious championship. Um, but I just feel like it's right up Jay White's alley. Jay White can be a world champion. At some point, he should be a world champion. But if we're going to give Jay White some gold... The tag title gold would be one thing, because him and Juice Robinson surprisingly work very well together. I say surprisingly, because I don't give a fuck about Juice Robinson, but they've made for a great team, and they had an amazing match with FTR last week on Collision. But if we're going to give Jay White some gold beyond the tag team titles, it comes down to not the world championship anytime soon, but either the TNT title or the international championship. The TNT title is not a fucking option. That title is just terrible. Like, who cares? Uh, Jay White is the international champion, to me, would make a whole lot of sense. So I got to put Jay White on that list. Miro already had his time with the TNT title. He made it important. I don't. I think those days are long gone. That belt is a lost cause at this point. Um, but maybe Miro getting a run with the international championship, which I thought he would win actually for Bidendor last year, would make a lot of sense. It never happened. Miro Malachi Black was another name that came to mind. Uh, Kanosuke Takeshka, I, th- I feel like would be a perfect fit for that championship. If it's not White, I think Takeshka is going to be the one to beat. Um, Orange Cassidy for that title at some point. He might lose it before Takeshka can beat him for it because I think he's going to be busy with Omega right now, so he probably won't have a chance to even beat Orange Cassidy for that title. Um, But yeah, Kanosuke, Miro, Malachi possibly, or Jay White to me would all be great fits for the international championship. And they're all heels too, so I think Miro might be a babyface now, but um, if he's a babyface, maybe not. But any one of those guys would be, you know, perfect candidates to, to dethrone Orange Cassidy in his undefeated, unstoppable reign as the international champion. At Bill Meister 88, his first question was, uh, can you see The Rock returning to WWE in 2023? Is it too much to think that the ending of SummerSlam could see him finally return to help Jay Uso against Roman Reigns? He teased he may show up sometime in the future in his video before Mania, and it seems like the perfect time. Could it happen? Yes. Do I think it'll happen? No. Um, I think we're past the point of them using Rock in a Roman Reigns story. I feel like the time to do that again would have been last year, the year before that, earlier this year going into Mania, and they missed the boat. Rock was just too busy, and he's holding out till next year. Who gives a shit? That ship is sailed. That would still be a big match. We could still get it at Mania. That that spot to me has got to be... It's got to have Cody Rhodes' name all over it. That should be Cody and Roman 2, Cody beating Roman. Uh, none of this shit where they drag it out even further, or they, go to, they give it to the fucking Rock instead. No. It's got to be Cody and Roman at Mania with Cody winning. I mean, that should have been the case earlier this year, but it didn't happen. Again, I complain about that every week. The Rock stuff, I mean, I'm not even really sure. I know what they're doing right now with the Tribal Chief stuff in the family, so you could tie it into that. But if The Rock comes back at SummerSlam, The Rock's not showing up every week. So if The Rock shows up at SummerSlam, that's really just planting the seeds for a match at WrestleMania. The Rock's not working a match anywhere but fucking WrestleMania. He's not working Payback. He's not working Survivor Series. He probably won't even work the Rumble. I know he's worked those shows in the past, 
He worked those shows in 2011 and 2013. Like, it, that was 10 years ago. Uh, 10 plus years ago. That's not happening. So if Rock's going to come back for a match, they're going to put it at WrestleMania. They should put it at WrestleMania. And that would mean that, like, even with the Brock stuff, like, I know they, they first did Brock and Roman. Brock came back at SummerSlam 2020 when that was like a six, eight month long story culminating at Mania. Actually, not even really, because they culminated it again. <laughs> they did a second culmination at SummerSlam uh, a couple months later. They had matches in between. They had a match at Crown Jewel. Brock was busy with Bobby. Um, he was inside the Elimination Chamber. Like, he was doing other stuff in that time period. It's not like where with Rock, Rock would not be wrestling at all. I mean, how many fucking promos can the Rock and Roman have between now and WrestleMania? So, that's even assuming that he would want to come back. Because if he did, they would really have to drag it out. And Roman might not even defend the fucking belt to WrestleMania at that point. Because we all know he's going to face the Rock. So, what's what's the point of him even defending the championship in the meantime, you know? Um, I, that's even assuming, again, he would want to come back or has the time to. I know I don't know exactly what he's busy with right now. I don't know what movies he's currently filming. Um, he's definitely filming less than he was in, in past years. He was always doing something. But right now, he's involved in a lot of shit that isn't going to be in theaters, I think. I don't know. He's not involved in a lot of big projects as far as movies coming out, um, at least compared to what he normally does. So he's probably obviously doing other stuff and staying busy with that. He's got his tequila line, among other things. Um, I just don't think he has the... He's not prioritizing WWE. Now, I mean, if he really wanted to prioritize it and come back, then he would have by now, but he hasn't, and he won't. So, again, that's assuming he would even come back. I don't think he's coming back anyway, so it doesn't even matter. So, no, I don't think The Rock is going to be back in 2023. Could he end SummerSlam? Sure. Is it going to happen? No, I wouldn't get your hopes up for it. I don't think it will. I think it's a lot more likely that they... Um, you know, that they just leave it the way that it is and they just continue on to the bloodline stuff as it is with Roman and Jay, Roman, Jimmy, whatever, coming out of SummerSlam. Roman will win at SummerSlam, but they will find a way to continue that and probably do Roman and Solo at some point between now and WrestleMania so we can set up Roman and Cody for WrestleMania 40. And the final question of the show, also from Bill Meister 88 your thoughts on Brian Pillman Jr. not resigning with AEW? Um, so he was not released. I know that was your initial question, but someone corrected you and mentioned that his contract expired. It's basically a release. Release indicates that they released him before his contract was up, but it wasn't his choice, I don't I mean, maybe it was. Maybe it was his choice to leave. I don't, I doubt it. Um, what else was he going to do? He was already in MLW. Could he go to Impact or something? I mean, I fucking guess, but they just don't want to use him anymore. I don't know why. I'm, I'm very surprised. I mean, if, if it comes out that it was his choice... I'm a little surprised. I'm not disappointed. I mean, they haven't done shit with him. This one's a bit of a surprise just because there. I just feel like there's got to be more to the story, whether he did something wrong or he pissed the wrong person off or something. If it's just a case where they didn't have any plans for him, it's because they have a million and fucking, they have a million and, and, and two people on that roster. But he's someone that you should have found plans for. I mean, Brian Pillman Jr. has potential. I think the guy's good. He's got charisma. He can go in the ring. He can talk. He's got a presence about him. More so than Griff fucking Garrison or Brock Anderson. I don't give a shit about those guys. I think Brian Pillman Jr. also had a lot of momentum coming off that Dark Side of the Ring episode a few years ago in late 2021. And they capitalized off that for a little bit in that MJF view. They had a match at Grand Slam. MJF beat him, and then we didn't see him on the show after that. I mean, he wasn't doing anything. He got the endorsement from John Moxley, and they didn't do anything with the guy after that. And I just didn't understand why. They put him right back in Varsity Blondes. I mean, the fact that Griff fucking Garrison is still there, but not Brian Pillman, assuming they let go of Brian Pillman Jr., and it wasn't his choice, that is just comical to me. I'm not saying he could have been a world champion, but he could have been a bigger star with more potential than how they booked him. They booked him as just another random tag team guy. Varsity Blondes did have some... Momentum at one point, but they never really pushed them beyond a certain level. It was never really their time. They got relegated to dark all the fucking time. I think Griff Garrison got hurt. And they didn't do shit with Brian Pillman Jr. on his own. They actually just put him with Brock Anderson. They put them together as a tag team. And I'm thinking, why? Like, who gives a shit? Oh, because they're fathers of the four horsewomen? Who cares? Or four, four, I said four horsewomen. Uh, because they're fathers of the four horsemen? I mean, who gives a shit? Brock, Brock Anderson does nothing for me. I mentioned this earlier on Twitter to someone, but someone mentioned, oh, he's another guy they're not doing anything with. That doesn't bother me because, not that he's like green green, but he's just not interesting. He's boring. He's decent in the ring. There's a lot of guys that are decent in the ring. I thought Brian Pillman Jr. had that it factor about him that could have helped him 
stand out a little bit more than how he did, but uh, apparently not because they never really utilized him at that level beyond that one Grand Slam match with MJF back in late 2021. So hopefully he can land on his feet and end up in a different promotion, whether it be WWE or Impact or whatever. Again, he was already in MLW. Him in NWA, that would be a, a, a significant downgrade. NWA sucks. Uh, I watch the show, I cover the shows, but their product is not good at all. Um, he's better. I mean, his presence fits the NWA, but he's got more potential than what they have to offer. Uh, him and WWE would be nice, though. I feel like him, he would be a good fit for that company, for NXT. We'll see if they have any interest or bother to pick him up. Um, only time will tell. And that's going to do it, guys, for today's edition of Hashtag Ask GSM episode 502. Here today for Wednesday, July 12th, 2023. Thank you guys for checking out my uh, Q&A video here on the show every single week. I appreciate it. Be sure to send in your questions by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRamble, the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook as well, facebook.com backslash gram.gsm.matthews. Drop a comment on the, po- uh, on the post I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself, on Facebook. And last but certainly not least, drop your question down below in the comment section in this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. Have a great rest of your week, folks. I'm Graham G.S. Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.